And let me pray for us and then we're gonna jump right in. Jesus, I am eternally grateful. God, just to sit in your presence this morning. I'm thankful to sing of your greatness this morning. God, you are great. And we proclaim it as loud as we could this morning. God, great are you, Lord. I pray this morning, God, in, in this time that we get to share studying your word, I pray that you would give us, God, an, an immense measure of wisdom and understanding, God, that far surpasses anything that we could ever think or imagine. I pray, God, that you would grant us uh, just a semblance of, of your Holy Spirit today, God, that would give us a clarity of thought and of mind. I pray, God, today that as we have proclaimed already, that, God, we would believe you. We would believe for your incredible, miraculous power to flow through us. God, as we speak, as we share, as we communicate your love to others, God, I pray that your incredible Holy Spirit would grant us, God, the wisdom, the words that we need to proclaim your truth. Jesus, we love you. We proclaim it from the loudest parts of our voice this morning that we love you, Jesus. It's your name that we pray. Amen. 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 Y'all can grab a seat. Uh, I just, we just got back from student camp, which uh, was awesome. Yeah. We had uh, 53 go down there and we saw God save lives for the very first time this week, and you're gonna see some of them. One of them's getting baptized this morning, uh, which is incredible. We'll have more baptisms in the days to come. We saw over a half dozen students commit to full-time ministry as their vocation in life, which is amazing to see this generation continue to rise up. Uh, and so I'm excited. So what that means is that puts the pressure on you and I uh, to be hopefully stewards of this next generation and to raise them up into the men and the women that God has called them to be. It puts a little bit of pressure on those of you who are a little bit older, wiser, right? Like myself, I'll put myself there for just this conversation uh, to recognize that we have an incredible gift that God has given us, which is a generation that is hungry to learn, grow, develop into godly men and godly women. And it is our calling now to stand alongside them, to raise them up, to give them the power and the wisdom that we have so that they can operate within the power of the Holy Spirit in their schools, on their sports teams, in their workplaces, and everywhere else. So I just wanna challenge you now at the front end, if you're not already involved in one of our next gen ministries, you are wasting your life. Please get involved in serving our next generation. It's not because we need you. Listen, we've got plenty of people who are serving. It's because you're missing out on an incredible opportunity to watch God bless you through just pouring your life out into other people. It's incredible. So you can do that uh, however you want to. Anyways, that's just my, my plug for the morning. I get paid a little extra when I say that, and so that's why I do it. That's not true. We, uh, we all have warning signs in our lives, right? We're, we're aware. If you drive, you know that a yellow light means go faster. You're not going to make it. Y'all are so wrong. Did you not go to driving school? Yellow light means go faster. It's about to be red. Okay, and if you get pulled over, the cop says, why'd you want the red light? You say, it was orange, officer. Red and yellow means orange, all right? So, you're welcome. Free gift today for all my new drivers, all right? Yeah, you got yield signs that tell you, like, be careful. There's cars coming in that same direction, right? You gotta be careful coming in. There's stop signs that tell you to stop because something's about to happen, right? And we, I'll just tell you this story. It's a little side tangent for just a second. Like, when we first got our driver's license, we told my mother, who's super gullible, and I love her to death. We told my mother that, we had just gone through this driver's training and that all of the stop signs that had white borders around them were now considered optional stop signs. We didn't have to stop through them. And so she hated us for a long time. So that only worked like two stop signs. We all have these warning. We know there's warning signs, right, in our lives. Some of them like uh, for the summertime, here we are, right? Our warning sign is you don't go outside without Sunscreen on, right? It's kind of stupid for you to do that. I have two colors, if you guys didn't know. I have this beautiful, uh, very pale Irish complexion, and then I have another version of this where you just color it with a red crayon, and that's the second version of me. So you can pick whichever one you want to see. Just let me walk outside for about 30 minutes, and I'll be the red one. That's me, right? I don't tan. I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy who gets to walk. Unless I spray it on, I'll never be the guy who has the beautiful tan skin. It's just who I am. 
I remember the learning this the hard way. We were at the pool. My brother and I were taken by my sister. I have two older sisters. One is nine years older than me and one is 14 years older than me. And so my sister who's nine years older than me took my brother and I to the pool because she was cool. And so really because she wanted to just lay out. So we go out and, uh, and, and we're having a good time. And my brother realizes, hey, I've got to put sunscreen on. And so she says, well, hey, I, you know what I think would be fun is if we drew something on you in sunscreen and then like when you tan, like it would show up. How fun would that be? And he goes, all right, cool. Do it on my stomach though so I can see it. She's like, all right. So I remember uh, I was in the pool and, and I remember her drawing something on there. She didn't tell us what it was and uh, rubbing it and making sure it was all set. And then we spent the rest of the day and they laid out by the pool, like on those little pool chairs and, and he got really nice and toasty red and I swam. We got home that night and we, you know, you shower after you get out of the pool and all that stuff. You just try to get the nastiness off of you. And, uh, and my brother begins to scream. Now listen, I, as a brother, there was nothing greater for me than watching my brother be in pain. Like watching my brother break under the pressure of pain was amazing. I remember the first time I hurt my brother, how much joy, an unreasonable amount of joy that it brought to me to watch him writhe in pain. So my brother gets out of the shower and he is screaming. He walks out and that dude looks like this. Show this picture right here. Yeah. Now you can't really see it great because we, we didn't grow up in the age where you have fancy cameras, right? So... So they had drawn his name, which is kind of smeared a little bit. She didn't do a great job. K-E-N, through the belly button there, the E kind of got weird. And then a little arrow pointing straight up to him. The rest of his body is bloodshot red. And he is screaming in pain, running around our house. We just had an air conditioner unit. We didn't have central air in our house. So we just had a, an air conditioner like window unit at the top. And so he's just standing like this going, why does it hurt so bad? And it's just, I mean, I'm laughing in the, I'm just sitting in the recliner chair going, you are so dumb. And he had to go to the hospital. It's fine. Anyways, he lived till sort of. Here's the thing. He knew going into it, right? We all know. I say this. I go to the beach. I'm like, it's fine. I'll get burned one time and then I'll tan. I don't. I just get a little bit less red. That's all. So I don't go to the beach, so I don't go swimming. I don't like to be red. But we all know, right? Unless you're wearing SPF 100, you know that there is a, a threat that you could potentially get summer. We all know the warning signs that come along with this life, but we often ignore them. The same is true when it comes to scripture. Pastor Greg gave me an, a really easy text this morning. He asked me to preach on hell. So last week we got to preach on heaven. We got to all have fun and woohoo. And today we're gonna to talk about the antithesis. Now, don't, don't tune me out. Now, if you walk out, I know you're walking out because you, you're scared. I'm gonna call you out on it, all right? So don't walk out. Now, we're gonna talk about hell. And I think it's important because I think if we don't understand the severity of hell, we will never understand the magnitude of heaven, the grace that God has displayed to us. So we're gonna walk through what does that look like today. Now, I do have to be very clear up front. We have to be very careful because anybody who kind of gives you <clears throat> like this is exactly what hell is, is just pining their own opinion because scripture doesn't actually lay out heaven is, or hell is this, hell is that. It doesn't, it's not like heaven because nobody's ever been there to write a book about it. That's not what it's like. You'll see a lot of like hell is like certain things. C.S. Lewis, when speaking of hell, said it this way. This is kind of my opinion on it as well. He said, there's no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it laid in my power, but it has the full support of scripture, which means we can't ignore it. If it's, if it's been written, we had to preach on it. Regardless, I remember one of our staff members, Haley, this morning came up to me. She said, are you excited to preach this morning? And I said, if you gave me a hundred sermons to preach, I would never pick this one. Because it's not a topic that makes you go, yeah, I came to church. It makes us uncomfortable. And I think, if we're honest, the reason why we've made it uncomfortable is because we've become so flippant about it. Think about just the word hell within your day-to-day -day vernacular. How do you hear it used? How do you hear it talked about? Typically, you hear the word hell in a swearing conversation, or that you're living hell on earth, or that if you walk outside today because Georgia's so hot, it's hotter than or I hope this is the closest I ever get to. If you think about the way you describe your job or your life, you typically use that particular word to describe it. We've become this kind of flippant nature about the particular word, which 
kind of numbs us to the severity of it. Think if I said the same thing. If I said, today we're going to talk about concentration camps. You're like, oh, God. Like, do you know what happened there, Chris? Can you use that illustration? Imagine if I, I talked about, hey, today we're going to use the same illustration of slavery and plantations back in the 1800s. You're like, whoa, whoa, hold up now. Like, do you know how disgusting and despicable the treatment of, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You see how there are certain words in our vernacular that make us go, no, 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 no. Do you not know the severity and the pain that comes along with that? I do. All I'm saying is that we've somehow along the way lost that same uh, 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 power within the word hell. Somewhere along the way, we've made hell more of a vacation that you can pick instead of heaven, instead of this terrible, awful place of torture and torment for those who choose not to follow Christ. And so this morning, what I want to do is just kind of lay out for you guys a few arguments and solutions. And I'll tell you why. I am a very logical-minded brain. I, I like uh, math. A plus B always equals C. It just is what it is. I couldn't be a Christian without A plus B equaling C. And so if you're in the room this morning and you're like, well, A plus B doesn't always equal C. When it comes to Christianity, I would love to take you to coffee because that's where I'm at. We'll work through the same stuff. So what I want to do this morning is walk through those arguments. I want to walk through some arguments about how God, if he's truly a loving God, wouldn't send people to hell. I want to walk through those arguments with you. I want to help you see through scripture, not my own opinion, because my opinion doesn't matter in the long run. I want to walk you through scripture exactly what it looks like for us to have a conversation, a true proper conversation about what hell is and why it should be as painful to think about as those other things I already mentioned. So if you have a Bible, we're going to kind of be in a couple of places this morning. We're going to start in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Here's what I need us to know first and foremost. Last week I talked about the Pew Research. And I talked about how Pew Research did this poll of Americans about heaven and hell, specifically the afterlife and what they believed in. And they said that 73% of Americans believe that there was a heaven. We talked about that. So if you missed that, go back last week. It's a much more joyful message. But then they equally asked people about hell. And they said 60 uh, 62% of Americans believed that there was a hell. 62%. Of those 62%, they asked five particular uh, things about hell to see what they thought. They asked people if they thought there was going to be psychological torment while they were in hell. 53% of the respondents that believed there was a hell, 53% said, yes, there's probably psychological torment. They asked the question if they thought that you were going to be aware, keenly aware of the torment that you had done on earth. If you're going to be aware of the things that you had done wrong on earth. And 53% of the people that responded that they believed there was a hell said, yep, I think we're going to be aware of that. They, they asked the respondents if there was going to be physical torture while in heaven. And 51% of the respondents said, yes, there'll be physical torture while in heaven. Not in hell, sorry. And then they asked if they thought they were gonna be able to have a relationship with Jesus while in hell. And 49% of the people said they did not think that you could have a relationship with God in hell. Now hold up just one second, because let me tell you what that means. That means that 51% of the people who responded thought somehow you could have a relationship with God and end up in hell. Eh, it's fine, like we'll get there, but like man, 50% of us believe somehow that a place whose, whose genuine presence is the absence of God, that somehow you're gonna have a relationship with God. 44% of them said they think you're gonna meet, have, uh, they're gonna meet Satan. And I still have to say, here's what we have to kind of, at the offset, here's what we have to know about hell. We have to create a proper foundation. One, that hell is a real place and that whole definition of it is that it is the absence of God's presence. That's the definition of hell. That is the absence of God's presence. That's it. What does that look like? Well, Paul lays out for us here in First Thessal or Second Thessalonians, sorry, chapter one. He says this: In His justice, God's justice, He will pay back those who persecute you. So he's talking to believers here. He says, he's going to pay back those who persecute you and, and God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't, who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Now, this is important, right? You've got to keep in mind, who is the one going away 
to hell is the ones who don't know God and those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction. Now, Paul could go, comma, and here's all the things that's going to happen to you. But he doesn't. He says eternal destruction, forever, what? Separated from God. Forever separated from the Lord and his glorious power. The very definition of hell is not the fire. It's being separated from God. It's having the relationship severed for all of eternity. Now you have to understand this about scripture. Scripture uses a lot of hell is like, but not a lot of hell is, okay? This is significant. They think different means that somebody's just trying to position their own opinion in front of you. And if that's the case, close the tab on Facebook or wherever you're reading it and delete it. That's garbage. Nobody actually knows because scripture never decides to give you the details. And that's important. Why? Do you know why? Because scripture isn't about how to get to hell. The purpose of scripture is helping us understand that there's a God in heaven who created you and created me, who saw the brokenness of our world and inserted himself into the equation, sacrificing his life for you and me so that we could have right relationship again with him, that us who were separated would be made right and whole with him. Scripture is all about God redeeming us, not our pathway to hell. We have to come in with that understanding or we're gonna walk in blind and trying to think, well, why doesn't they, why don't they talk more about hell? Because that's not the purpose of the Bible. What does it tell us? I think that's important. In the Old Testament, the word that's typically used is this word sheol or sheol, depending on how southern you are, that all can change. S-H-E-O-L. And that word in particular typically means like death, destruction, a pit, or could mean hell, which makes it difficult when you're translating. So just a little bit, uh, a little side tangent here of understanding scripture. Every verse of scripture lives within what's called context, which means you can't just pull one out, slap it on your coffee mug or under your eye black and think that it makes sense because it's out of context. Everybody understands the context of what's happening. So you can't just go in and pull uh, Psalm 24, seven out of context and go, boom, look at that verse. Why? Because Psalm 24 lives in the context of Psalm 22 through 24, which is all about the crucifixion of Jesus. So if you pull that verse out and you're like, I like this one. Like, but you have to understand what, what it actually means first, right? Everything lives in the context. All books live in context. You read any book, doesn't matter. Math book, all of it lives in context, right? I don't understand this about. So when you're translating this word Sheol in the Old Testament, all of it is built on context. It shows up 65 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes it means death, sometimes it means destruction, sometimes it means a pit, sometimes it means hell. It shows up in the book of Exodus, it shows up in the book of Numbers, in the book of Daniel. It shows up a bunch in the Psalms. And here's what is fascinating about most of the times that it shows up. Do you know what it's describing? Us not being separated from God. You know, the psalmist say, please don't send me down to Sheol, which is away from you. From being with you. Don't send me there. Keep me close. Tell me, flip to the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's two big words you would see in the New Testament. One of those words is Hades, which typically is like a death of destruction as well. It could also mean hell. You see it in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus uses it to describe the opposite of heaven. You see that word Hades dropped in there. So you see Jesus use it within that context of specifically talking about the opposite of what heaven is. It's important, right? Context always matters. But the word that's probably most popularly used within the New Testament is the word Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A, Gehenna. If you've heard it before, maybe you haven't. Now, the context of Gehenna matters a lot. See, Jesus understood what he wasn't going to do was come to earth and go, here's what hell is. That's not the purpose. We're gonna talk about what the purpose is in just a minute. Instead, he uses a cultural, some cultural nomenclature and goes, here's what hell is like. Y'all know Gehenna, right? Maybe you don't, but they did. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that place on the south side of the city? Yeah, yeah, just outside the gates. Now, a little bit of context on Gehenna. This is super important. It was a valley that in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 31, that they would, uh, the, the people would commit idolatry, 
They would, they would cre- uh, commit child sacrifices. There's a place known for death. It's very dark. So nobody would go down to this, what was called the Hinnom Valley. They would go, no, 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 like, don't go down there. That's the place where they do some really nasty stuff. And then in 2 Kings, this guy by the name of Josiah stops all of it. He goes, no longer will this be a place known for child sacrifice or idolatry or murder or death. No longer will that be the case. Instead, it'll just be a dump. It'll be a place where you place your trash and your sewage. It'll be this place called Gehenna, this place called the Hinnon Valley. Like, be down there. That's fine. It's a place where there was constant fire burning to burn all the trash and the sewage that was placed down there. And so understand when Jesus steps onto the scene, he sees this, pulls the culture of nomenclature and goes, hey, guess what? Hell is like that place. Y'all honor that place, right? Yeah, we don't go down there, Jesus. No, no, no. And you don't want to because it's worse than that. So everything kind of builds. You begin to see this picture painted of what hell is like. Then you begin to wonder, right? Well, who's there? How do you get there? I think Jesus speaks into this as well. I think it's important for us to understand that hell is simply the result, the eternal result of our earthly living. Hell is the eternal result of our earthly living. In in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus does a a little bit of helping us understand this. Because here's the argument, right? Well, Well, if God's just a mean God, then if he's just sending people to hell. What a mean God that just stands up there. And in the Old Testament, right, he's just smiting people left and right. He's flooding the world. He's killing everybody. He's the worst God. Then he gets to the New Testament, and you're telling me that all he's doing is sending people to hell? What a mean, nasty God. I don't want to serve that God. And Jesus actually, I think, speaks pretty well into that particular argument. Because here's what we have to know is that God gave you and I all a choice a decision to make as to whether or not we were going to reject God or run to him. And so uh, God's not the mean one standing ahead. No, he's giving you over to the choices and decisions that you have made. And so to blame God is, is in essence to be self-centered still. Think about how much grace God has granted you in this life. Think about the maybe the near-death experiences you've had that you're like, holy cow, like God, you've redeemed me out of that moment. Thank you so much. Now, think about the prayers that you've prayed in the moments of your darkest valley, and I just wonder that those prayers stayed true. Did you still serve a God who you prayed, God, if you just save me, I'll... So there's these moments in our lives where we have to reckon with the fact that maybe we just chose not to follow God. And then God said, okay, because love is not forced. It can't be forced. I can't force you to love me. There's no way. I remember, <clears throat> I loved speech class, if you couldn't tell. I loved speech class. In high school, I did a six minute informative speech on feces, which if you guys have any questions about it, see me afterwards, very good at it. I know why it changes colors. I know why birds are white. I know all of it. It's a great speech. I had examples. <clears throat> It's all true. I did not make a great grade. I got to college. The first class I took my freshman year was speech class. They called it oral communications, how to talk. And I love that class because I love to talk. No need, no need for affirmation there. And I remember at my first speech, they said, you get, a four, you get four minutes. So four minute informative speech on whatever you want to talk about. Now, I was born and raised just outside of Baltimore. And then when I was 11, our house got condemned. We moved to the, to the Pennsylvania and we lived about 45 minutes outside of Hershey's. So I love Hershey's chocolate. If you love any other chocolate, God is not honored with you. Come down here right now. Let us, I got oil right here. Let me like, I'm just kidding. No, it's not true. Hershey's chocolate is the best chocolate. But if you don't believe that, you are wrong. So I did a four, what was supposed to be a four minute informative speech on Hershey's chocolate. Ended up going eight minutes because I'm an overachiever uh, and I ended up getting a 50% deduction on my grade because of it. Eight minutes on Hershey's chocolate. It's a great speech. I could do it right now if you want me to. Now, I got to the end and I sat down. There's a girl sitting diagonal to me. I'll never forget it. There's a girl sitting diagonal to me. Beautiful brunette girl. She's a cheerleader. I got to know her because, you know, we were diagonal mates, you know? (laughs) And I remember I sat down 
after what I thought was the greatest speech I've ever made, I sat down and I gave out Hershey kisses at the end. And I looked back at her. If you're single right now, you're going to write this one down. And I said, hey girl, you want to kiss? And she said, never. <laughs> I know. Listen, girls, listen. I know sometimes you got to shut guys down, okay? But like, don't cut to the core of who I am as a person, you know? Like, not today, maybe later, don't ever call me again. Like, that's, whew. She said, never. I said, okay. And I took it back. That girl ended up marrying my brother. It's a true story. <laughs> and they never let me live that down. I had to go to my brother and be like, hey, I straight up hit on her. And she said, never. He goes, I see why. She already told me, you're an idiot. And I was like, all right. It's fine. That rejection though, right? Now imagine if I go, I don't care what you say, we're getting married. Here's a ring, put it on that finger, you're done. That's not love. She's not chosen to love me. I just forced her to be in relationship with me. So when we look and have the conversation of God is so mean, no, God is so loving that he said, I'm not going to force you to love me. I'm going to lay it all out before you. I'm going to place this beautiful creation before you. I'm going to allow you to see my love through other people. I'm going to allow you to experience it through serving. I'm going to allow you to do all these things and experience the immense grace, love, mercy poured out for you. I'm going to send my son, sacrifice him on your behalf so that you and I might have a relationship together. He goes, no, 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 I'm not me. I'm displaying the greatness of my love before you. And I give you a choice today. I place it before you. Choose you this day who you will serve. Either Christ or yourself. And for us to look at God and go, God, you're so mean. It's a fallacy. It's wrong. It's not who he is. So Jesus lays it out in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, he says, he's been talking through this final judgment. He says, you're gonna come to the Son of Man and he's gonna have this whole conversation. And this is what he says about those who did not respond. He said, then you will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I'll tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, you're refusing to help me. Jesus reflected through all of us. And then he paints the picture for us. He says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So there's this juxtaposition between punishment and life that's immediately played out. There's this self-centered nature within all of us as human beings that says it has to be all about me. It's self-pity, it's self-justification of what I've done. It's, it's all about me in some level. We have to fight back against that false ideology in our minds that tells us that somehow the world result revolves around me. And then there's this other side of this God-centered life that we are called to be living. And that God-centered life, rather than placing ourselves at the center, places him at the center, which makes us whole, makes us complete. It fills the void that chasing after everything else that Adler talked about this morning, chasing after all those things, hoping that they will satisfy and fulfill us. Guess what they do? They just force us back to more of it. It's never satisfying. It doesn't matter how many drugs you do. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how many girls or guys you're with. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff will ever satisfy or fulfill the desire of your heart. It can't do it. Pleasure is temporary. It's fleeting. So we must cling to the thing that actually is satisfying. That's what he's talking about. Tim Keller says it this way. He says that hell then is a trajectory of a soul living a self-absorbed, self-centered life going on and on forever. In short, hell is simply one's freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. Hell in short is our self-centered selves choosing to be our own master rather than submitting to the one who created us. It is pride at its finest. So God gives us his choice. So I wanna, as we come to a close, I wanna, I wanna bring this whole thing full circle. I wanna paint a picture for you, a very clear imagery of what hell is. At its core, Hell displays God's love for us. 
Now look, I know you're all going to be like, how does hell display God's love for us? That sounds crazy. Hear me out. You could probably make the argument that couldn't God have created a world in which hell doesn't exist? And I would argue back, yes. Hypothetically speaking, God could have created the entire world and said, you know what I don't want to be there? Hell. Now, if that is the case, guess what instead we become? We become robots. What we become instead of free will choice choosing to follow Christ, we instead just have to do whatever he tells us to do. We lose the sense of freedom that we have to actually pursue a relationship with him. At our core, the reason why having a relationship with God matters is because we've chosen to have it. Just like you had that choice to have your best friend or that choice to have your spouse. You've chosen to have that relationship. That relationship matters deeply because of it. But if God creates a world without hell, then all we've done is create heaven. And let me tell you about how to get there. You see, because at its core, heaven is us being in the presence of God. I said last week, if you want to get to heaven, but don't care if God is there, you're actually just wanting to go to hell. Because God's presence is the only reason we want to be in heaven to start. His presence is what makes heaven, heaven. So as we look at this, I want us to think about the fact that, I mean, even as we celebrate this week, this 4th of July, we have, as Americans, been enamored with this idea of freedom. We fight for freedom, we fight for freedom for all. We fought over the years for freedom for the rights of every person, and we're still fighting for the rights of some. And here's what I know to be true, that if we truly want genuine freedom, that freedom is, e at the end of it all, it just equals the opportunity for somebody to choose. I want to be able to choose whether I can vote or can't vote. I don't want you to impinge that, that uh, thing on me. I want to be able to make that choice for myself. I want to choose whether or not I want to answer to the king or not to the king. I want to be able to have the choice to get rid of somebody who I don't agree with. Like, we have these choices in America because men and women fought, died, sacrificed so that we could have that freedom. The same is true within the church. The reason we have the freedom that we have, the reason that we have the freedom to either choose Christ or not choose Christ is because he sacrificed, bled, died, so you and I could have that choice. So Paul tells us in Romans 5 exactly what this looks like. He says, now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, but someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good. But God showed his great love. See that? for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. While we were still opposed to God, we were still chosen to be our own masters, he died for us. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will save us from God's condemnation. We gotta catch that. God shows great love for us by sending Jesus. And because of Jesus, now we have this incredible opportunity to choose Christ. I hate the thought of hell. I hate talking about it. I hate the fact that people are going there. I hate it. I hate war and I hate starvation in the world. I hate the fact there's enough money in this world already to completely solve and cure world hunger and thirst, and yet for some reason, we still have yet to do it. It's a different message for another day, but at the end of the day, I hate it. But my hate for it doesn't change the facts. Just because you hate something doesn't change the truth of it. So I can hate it, until Jesus comes back. But what it ought to do instead is put a weight and a pressure inside of me to go, I don't want anybody to experience it. I don't want anybody to be outside of the presence of God. And I could sit here and 
and do a talk on the flames and the burning and the eternal torment, all the things that go along with it. But, but listen, at the end of the day, here's what I need us to hear. It's the relationship with Jesus that matters the most, not where they're going. I don't need you to escape hell. I need you to love Jesus. That's it. I don't need you to go out into your workplaces, into your schools with your families and go, don't go to hell. That ain't gonna work. It's not about that. Going to heaven, I told you last week, going to heaven, the purpose of that is not to escape hell, it's to be with Jesus. So I would rather preach today, love Jesus. Have a relationship with Jesus, yeah? And when we're willing to just sit in that, it changes everything. I just want you to have a relationship with the Lord today. That's it. I want you to taste and see the goodness of God. I want you to build your life on something that will not fail you, that will not leave you, that will not desert you when you're at your lowest. I want you to build your life on something that brings joy in the midst of sadness, that that lifts you up when you're at your darkest moment, that never leaves you or forsake you. I want you to build your life, not on something that is sinking or destroyed, but rather something that is firm and solid, and that is building your life on Christ and Christ alone. That's what Paul's getting after in Romans. And we have this beautiful truth but God is going to give you what you want. If you desire today to worship him, to have a relationship with him, he will give it to you. If you desire today to flee from him and to reject him, he will give it to you. Romans 1 says that he will give over those who are sitting over to their sinful habits. He will not force himself on you, but he will continue to present himself there. And God is too loving. And maybe you've heard that argument, right? Man, a loving God wouldn't send somebody to hell. He's not sending you there. You got, our language is broken. I tell my kids all the time, right? Dad, I said I was sorry. Yeah, but the consequences of your actions and decisions have led you to this point. The beautiful thing about the gospel He said, at any moment, you cry out to him and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Guess what? Full restoration. Perfectly made whole. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's where it is for you and I. So today, may we change our shift, our language. Move it away. For God, he doesn't hate you. He doesn't hate your family, your friends. He deeply loves you and wants a relationship with you. Today you have that choice. You have that choice to choose whether or not you're going to pursue Christ or pursue the things in this world. Revelation 5 is very clear about what's going to happen to us. Revelation 5 says that we sing a new song in heaven. You are worthy to take the scroll, to break its seals, to sing this about the lamb, about Jesus. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God, from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. Believer in the room this morning, you are going to stand in the presence of God one day. Every tribe, tongue, nation will be represented before him. Those of you in the room this morning that don't have that relationship, that haven't begun a relationship with God, can I just challenge you this morning to not walk out of this room, to not shoot one firework off before getting right with him. He longs to have a relationship with you So today, I just wonder, will you choose Jesus today? Will you choose to have a relationship with him today? Not to escape hell, but to live for him. To have the excitement and anticipation of one day I get to stand face to face with a God who loved me so much. That he sacrificed his life for me. Like, that's the joy. Man, will you choose him today? Let me pray for us. God, I am so thankful for the opportunity and the privilege that you've given us to be here in freedom. I thank you for the freedom that you've given us to make choices and decisions to follow you or to oppose you. And so this morning, I just pray 
God, that you would give us the boldness to choose you this morning. I pray for those who sit in the room this morning who walked in but they're guard up who walked in going, I'm not gonna choose Jesus this morning. I'm just here to appease somebody. I'm here because I got drug here. I'm here. I don't really wanna be here. I just can't wait to get out. I just promised free lunch and I can't wait to get to lunch. Man, I just pray God that you would begin to wreck their heart right now. That you would begin a, a work of your Holy Spirit in their lives right now, Jesus. I pray right now, God, that you would do what only you can do in this room. God, I feel that there's there are people here this morning who need you. So with every head bowed, I just wanna pray over you. If this morning you're wrestling through having a relationship with Jesus and you're wrestling through choosing him this morning, can I just pray over you? Can I give you an opportunity this morning just to pray? Maybe you don't know how to do it. You don't know what that looks like. I just wanna give you an opportunity this morning just to talk directly to God. I don't matter. It's you and him this morning, but but I wanna give you some language maybe to share with him if that's okay. Just pray something like this. God, I need you. I don't have a relationship with you. And today I wanna start that relationship. I ask for the forgiveness of my sin. I ask for forgiveness for how I've opposed you. God, I ask you to make me new. I wanna walk in relationship with you all the days of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Use me for your glory. With every head bowed and eyes, I just wanna pray over those who maybe this morning, that's where you're at. Maybe this morning, that's what you're walking through. And today you gave that your heart to Christ for the first time. You said, you know what? I need Jesus. I wonder if you'd be so bold this morning and sit. I said, just raise your hand around the room this morning. If that was you and you said, I need Jesus this morning. You prayed that this morning. Can I just pray? Yeah, praise God. Praise God. 